Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. And joining me right now is the one and only Andy McCarthy, of course, former federal prosecutor, contributing editor at National Review and senior fellow at the National Review Institute, best-selling author. Hello, Andy. Steve, how are you? I'm doing great. I love reading your stuff at National Review, covering this whole FBI adventure, the Comey adventure, the Hillary adventure, the whole thing. But it all ties into yesterday's testimony. You know, we were told to expect a blockbuster from Sally Yates, the former acting attorney general. And to me, we got just what we knew we would get, which was, I mean, everything we knew already, she just reiterated. We heard from her for the first time. But I want to skip ahead maybe here and, and, and talk about what she admitted, which to me is the headline. Against the decision of the Justice Department, who decided that the, the, the executive order signed by Donald Trump regarding the travel ban was constitutional, um, and correct me if I'm using the wrong language, she decided uh, not to defend it because she didn't think Donald Trump's intent would meet constitutionality, which is an extension of what we've seen from these courts, which is new legalese. Now, what have I said that's wrong? <laughs> No, you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. What the Justice Department reviewed it, the uh, Office of uh, Legal Counsel, which is like the lawyer's lawyer at the Justice Department, and they decided that it was legal, that it passed muster. Now, understand, the Justice Department's job is not to say whether it's good policy, and they may think it's shameful policy, but their job, strictly speaking, is, is it legal and defensible? And the answer to that question is very straightforward. It's yes. Um, and if there's a reasonable argument for defending a statute, uh, the, the Justice Department is supposed to defend it unless the president decides that it's not going to be defended because he doesn't think it's constitutional. The Justice Department works for him. And they owe the government and the public, uh, who the government actually works for, the best legal representation and the best legal argument that can be made for a constitutionally valid legal position. So would you say she had, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's the right, uh, what are the right words? She had no business uh, not, not deciding not to defend it or she had no legal right to decide not to defend it? She, Steve, I'm going to say the same thing I said at the time, which is that she was insubordinate uh, and she did not have a good faith legal basis to not defend the statute. Now, she claims uh, that she had a constitutional objection to it. She personally did. She didn't say that at the time, by the way. Uh, she said that it wasn't just, but she wasn't making the constitutional claim uh, at the time, and probably because she knew OLC had, had basically signed off on it. But she made herself basically the court rather than the Justice Department and decided that in her eccentric view of the Constitution, uh, it would be uh, that that the executive order was not defensible. And she now claims to have been vindicated because left-leaning courts that haven't followed the law came out the same way that she did. So, you know, look, ultimately, I guess this will all get resolved by the Supreme Court and, um, and you know, we'll get a better sense of, uh, of what a final statement of the law is by the United States courts. But what Sally Yates owed the government and the Trump administration and the Justice Department was to give the best defense of this statute that was legally possible to give. Right. No, I, that, 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 that's what's, what really stuck out uh, for me yesterday, and I'm, I, I knew that you would uh, feel similar. Uh, let, let me ask you about uh, uh, Clapper. Who uh, talk about the 17 intelligence agencies? You know that was a big deal during the campaign. That all 17 intelligence agencies. Then I was told or read that there aren't even 17 intelligence agencies. Maybe there are, but Clapper said yesterday that uh, signing off on the narrative that Russia um, uh, interfered in our election. Uh, we've been told or we've been led to believe that all 17 intelligence agencies believe that and agree with that. And he said not all of the 17 have affirmed that. How significant is that, if at all? Well, I think it's very significant, Steve. And I've been saying for a while now that I think we, I, I hate this term, the intelligence community. Uh, I know it's a legal term, and there is actually statutes that re refer to it, the inspector general is uh, of the intelligence community is called the 
inspector general of the intelligence community. So it's a it's a legal term. I think it's a very misleading one because it, it conveys the idea, which is a wrong one, that there's like one big undifferentiated whole. And in point of fact, there are about 17 components of the intelligence community. They're not all formal agencies. Um, some of them, like the uh, you know the, the National Security Council at, at the White House, um, are not you know political appointees. They're executive branch sort of uh, glorified intelligence-based political appointees. Uh, and the important thing here, Steve, I think, is that only three of these agencies really go out and do the work that we think of as intelligence collection. That would be the FBI in the uh, domestic framework. Uh, the CIA and the NSA. The other agencies are all consumers of classified information, and most of them deal with it from a policy perspective, although, uh, you know, like the military uh, intelligence agencies obviously uh, have a, a sort of a tactical component to their analysis. But, uh, but the point is, they're, they're not, there are not 17 agencies. Uh, they all were not involved in this investigation of Russia. They all are not in harmony over whether it all means or what it all means. And in point of fact, as you pointed out at the beginning, what we get at by the end of the hearing yesterday for all the, uh, you know, the ballyhoo that we heard before it was that we're in exactly the same place where we came in. Nothing new happened. Right. Uh, nothing, no new news was broke or broken. And, you know, I think in, in many ways it was like a kangaroo court. Uh, because the, the questioning senators, especially on the Democratic side, all know that Ms. Yates is not going to testify about anything. Basically, every time a new question comes up, she says, well, I can't talk about that. It's classified. I had my concerns about Flynn, but I can't tell you what they are because they're classified. And when you know that the witness is not going to answer the question, you have free reign unless there's a judge there to rein you in. Uh, to fill your questions with all kinds of bombast and explosive details right. and facts that have not been proven, and that's what happened. And you're right, knowing full well she's not going to answer it. Two, two more, but they're important. Uh, I want to go back to the executive order. Yesterday there was a court, and I believe in Virginia, that heard arguments on the, uh, the legality, constitutionality of the travel ban, order number two, I believe. Um, and and one, an ACLU lawyer apparently argued before the judge that, and this again goes to this intent nonsense, that if Hillary Clinton were president and she had made that executive order, it would have passed constitutional muster, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, right. because her intent wasn't previously stated in the campaign that I want to ban Muslims, so it would have been okay, but since we know Donald Trump's intent, um, it's not okay. I mean, is that a legal argument? It's the same argument that Sally Yates made her testimony yesterday. It's the same argument that the Ninth Circuit made and some of these judges made. You know, look, there's supposed to be between and among the branches of the federal government an assumption that unless something is screamingly unconstitutional or illegal, uh, everybody is acting in good faith and everybody is uh, presumptively constitutional in their actions. Uh, and instead, what we have with Trump is, you know, this newfangled assumption uh, that even if he does something legal, he's got unconstitutional designs and unconstitutional intentions. So it's somehow more important what Rudy Giuliani said on the campaign trail right. than it says in the four corners of an executive order. Is that going to stand, Andy? Not to interrupt. Is that going to legally stand? Before, I mean, when it, do you believe when it gets to the Supreme Court? And if it does, is that a brand new precedent? It would. <laughs> it would be a ruinous precedent if it if it stood. But I. <laughs> Now that the Supreme Court is back to nine, uh, I would be very surprised if the if the justices indulge this way of thinking. Because if they do, then Trump can't be president. I mean, not in any effective sense. Because every single decision he makes, every single bit of guidance he gives, no matter how consistent it is with statutory and constitutional law, will be second guessed because of you know some mind right. reader robe. That is that, incredible. That, that, that is incredible. One more. Today we find out 
reportedly, that uh, Comey misspoke when he testified the other day under oath before the committee. Uh, Uma Abedin did not uh, transmit or uh, hundreds or thousands of emails to Anthony Weiner. It was much, much less. Um, all right, so he's going to fix that testimony legally. He won't be charged with perjury, I wouldn't imagine. But does it, in your view, in your mind, you've been on top of this, you know, every detail, does it change the scenario at all for what she did? It, it doesn't change the scenario as far as I'm concerned in terms of what the importance of it is, Steve. I, it, look, I know Jim Comey for a long time. He would never commit perjury in court testimony. And if he misspoke, it's because he misspoke. That said, the FBI and the Justice Department are not supposed to speak about the evidence derived from cases that don't get charged. And what we're seeing now is exactly why that shouldn't happen. And I, you know, you know, I have no, I'm not holding any great brief for uh, for Huma Abedin. Uh, but the reason that the government has to speak in court is that's where a defendant who's formally accused of something has a right to defend himself and to refute the charges. And if you're just talking about evidence in cases that you don't bring, you run the risk of smearing people in the court of public opinion. And I'm, I'm afraid that that's what all this. Um, all this talking about cases outside the framework of actually charging people, you know, put your money where your mouth is and indict them. Right. And if you're not going to indict them, shut up. Yeah. Andy, great to talk to you, my friend. As always, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve.